lower tariffs as quickly as Jackson's did. So it wasn't as good for what Calhoun said he wanted, but he, but this one, South accepted. The South accepted this tariff. Because they're defeated. South Carolina had no choice. They were humiliated and they had to accept this. Nullification is now off the table. It's kind of funny that South Carolina turned around and nullified the force bill. Like that meant anything now because they had been so defeated. And so this is where Jackson saved the union. Jackson saved the country right here. If nullification would have gone the route and the U.S. would have belatedly tried to enforce the law, to try to enforce it early, the National Convention would have took place. There, that would have directly led to civil war. The United States would have lost that civil war in 1833. So the U.S. would have been gone. And a couple things about that. First off, nullification as an issue, gone. If nullification is gone, what's the only other option that southern states are going to have if they feel they have no choice but to do something to defend slavery? And that's where we get secession. Secession might be their only choice. So yes, the union was saved, but it did not solve the problem. I should add one more thing. Jackson viewed this as I'm fighting up, I'm fighting for the common man here. These are the elites, the plantation owners. And Jackson is fighting for the common man to give them power, not just the whim of these few planter elites to try to control the government or destroy the government. And so, yeah. So, like, during Andrew Jackson's presidency, did he kind of go from being, like, a common man to elite to some degree? No, he stayed pretty elite the whole time. I mean, he's pretty common man the whole time. I say elite the whole time. <laughs> Actually, you could, um, it was unclear. His, he always had this idea that he was a common man in the first few years. But then it be, began to really take shape with this. Any removal to his point of view is for the common man, and the next one's fully for the common man. Now, you can make the argument, wait a minute, maybe his policies didn't really help the common man. And that's, you can argue that, but he always had that least motivation. And a couple of things about that. You can, all of you I know want to sing the Jackson and the Nullifier song. So everybody, you ready? Who brought their piano? Come prepare. Yeah, the words are absolutely ridiculous, but it's Jackson and the Nullifiers. And this is Jackson Square in New Orleans. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Isn't that just a stunning artistic work? And whoever took that must have just a great artistic eye. Who's with me on that? Sometimes you kind of luck out. <laughs> yeah, they're not really cool. It's one of those, wow, that's neat. That's the clouds. And the other thing, there were people everywhere, and you can't really see hardly any people. You can't see any people at all. And they're just everywhere. But Jackson. This is a statue of Jackson after the Battle of New Orleans, which makes sense. It would be a big statue there in Jackson Square. The river is like about half a mile in that direction. That picture. Not even half a mile, maybe 200 yards. New York Park is this way. And it's, it's actually really fun. But when the United States, the Union, took New Orleans in 1862, and the commander there, a general named Butler, you know, this is in the South, and so we added the word from Jackson's toast to the statue. So the United States did this as kind of a slap in the face to the secessionists. The Union must and shall be preserved. And that's why they're there. What year was that? Yeah, Jefferson. So it's going to be called the Jefferson Dinner and then Jefferson Jackson. Yep. So let's get to the next big issue because what we have then. Jackson's ideas are shaping up. Didn't mean that everybody agreed, and it wasn't a clear, coherent economic policy, but we're coming to the idea of Jacksonian economics. And the Jacksonian economics was democracy to his point of view, where the people must have power. And the way he looked at it is government should not just help a few or sit back and do nothing. We all must have, and that's where we get these shared values, purpose, and destiny. We all have the same common wealth, or they would say common wheel. I know it's kind of weird, but it's W-E-A-L, which means we're all in this together. And the government has such powerful role in the economy that we must use that power 
to help everybody. We all must have the same goal. That fits in with an idea of the common good, but also majority. And one of the key elements of this, I should add, this is significantly different than conservative economics or laissez-faire. So, first off, economics, political, and government has a role. And if you think about Jacksonian democracy, if government has a role, and government is of the people, therefore the people have a role. And so the people do not have to accept if, uh, like for example, the inequalities capitalism can create. It doesn't have to accept that. It can make changes because the people have power. This is a pretty significant difference. This is not laissez-faire and competition. Next, they feared capitalism and the inequalities it creates. Remember, capitalism is this amazing, amazing engine for in, um, ingenuity, for creation, for all these new innovations. The capitalist takes the risk, and part of the risk is creating something different sometimes, but then they get all the profit. And the other thing about capitalism is it does have a focus to monopoly. You know, everyone tries to get rid of your competition, but not least develop. We see this right now. I can't say anything bad about Amazon because they're watching. But, oh, don't write that one up. I have this in the wrong order by mistake. And so because of this, this idea of the inequalities, they fear the wage system. And they are more pro, you notice how I spell labor? You see that? You might think that's like an English, more like from England version. Labor with the U on that concept does not mean just labor as workers. We're talking about labor as an organization. So that's what that labor means. So it's not just pro-labor workers. It's the labor organization, specifically what groups of workers that are starting to form with the Industrial Revolution? Yeah, unions. What pro-union meant or how long this would remain, that's up in the air and it's arguable. But then back to they fear the speculation that came with this. As wealth is being created, they start to try to get rich quick and invest in new technology or, or specifically land. What they wanted, or and then the debt that went with this. Hey, it's plantation owner. They're terrified of debt. They wanted more hard money policies to control credit, to keep people from borrowing too much to speculate. What's hard money? It's not just actually, I mean, but a certain type of money. Yeah, but, not, but it has to be gold or silver coin. Soft money is just paper currency or what they would call today fiat money, just created by the government. Print money. There's money. You say there's money, there's money. Hard money is this <laughs> concept of money is only something you can tangibly touch, like gold or silver. Where paper money is abstract. It's a piece of paper that says it's worth this much money. Now, he might have been riding the credit control. <coughs> Hard money actually is really, 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 really unstable. And actually leads to more debt. We'll find that out in the turn of the next century. We do not have hard money today. We have all soft. It's all fiat money. It's much easier, easier to control when you credit yourself. But that's another story. I'll tell you more about that down the road. And then the Bank of the US with the symbol of all this, that bus. It was the symbol of this unelected group of people with such huge control. It was the first corporation, and that became the target. The bank is the one that loans money, puts out the, uh, the soft money, allowing for easy credit, making it easier to borrow money, and speculation, and debt, and financial bubbles, and financial crashes. And this is the beginnings of liberal economics. But I'm not saying that liberal economics had all these policy prescriptions. It's not a lot. It's more of the attitude. Where lots of fair economics, which is conservative, the idea is, okay, government does have this great role in the economy, and they should focus money in the hands of the wealthy and the capitalists. Because they're the smarter, they can make wealth. Where the liberal idea is, no, we can't focus the money into them because then they'll take control and dominate. We must have more, not only money, but also job security for the working class and performance. And that is more liberal. I will talk more about this down the road. Conservative will become trickle down. Liberal economics, there's going to be a lot of different alterations and messing with socialism.
but we'll become Keynesian economics, of course, right? I know all of you are thinking, when are you going to get to Keynes? Got to wait till the 1930s. You're not as excited as I thought you would be. So, here maybe is my greatest, my favorite picture from this era. So here is Jackson fighting Nicholas Biddle, the head of the bank, for the future of the country. So we're all watching. And in Biddle's corner, the head of the bank of the United States, there is Henry Clay, there is Daniel Webster. Remember, we mentioned him with the Webster Hain debate. And this represents what kind of person? Yeah, wealthy. Good diet, so that would always draw them as a little bit bigger. And port, that was a kind of a, a really sugary, very fancy dessert wine that only the wealthy could get. And so here are the more common people. So we have a soldier going back to Jackson's um, role during the various wars. There's Martin Van Buren, kind of does look like And then, of course, every man. Old fashioned whiskey, but how do we know he's like hey, the common man? Yeah, he obviously has a cat on his head. And that represents democracy, freedom, cats on their head. And I don't know why this cat seems to be actually part of the hat, doesn't it? Look at that. And so cats are the animal that best represents democracy. And I'll tell you what else, too. Both cat and cat hat and hat, cat hat wearer. That's, I, I just try to ponder that one. <laughs> what kind of food do they eat? What food do they eat? What food represents democracy? They had it at Jackson's inauguration. Cheese! Doesn't it all come together? Cheese. Look carefully. You can't see the cheese because they already ate it to prepare for the fight. And so, yeah, so today I voted and to prove that I represent, I believe in the American ideal of democracy, what did I do? I ate a piece of cheese and wore my cat on my head <laughs> to vote. And this might shock you, but my cat was unamused. But I care. Do you like the grumpy cat? Huh? The grumpy cat. Oh, my cat is very friendly. Crazy. So, this leads into what's called the bank war. And the bank war would be, this really kind of tied together Jackson's ideal of the common man. And, as he saw, the bank represents, here's the first national bank, I'll talk more about that in a second, but you know, this is this establishment. In fact, this big money elite, they talk about like it was a conspiracy. <laughs> You know, it kind of fits in that they would believe in the Masons. And Jackson's fighting for the common man. Here's the first bank of the United States. Now it's a private bank across the street from the White House. And you see that style, the same style as many of the government buildings in Washington, D.C., including the White House and the Capitol. Anybody know the architectural style? What's that? And you're close. They actually call it Greek or Roman as neoclassical. So, yeah. And so this is classical. So it is Greek or Roman that kind of go back. That's how you know the columns. And remember the columns. So it's a pretty neat building, too. It's made of marble. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of confused, like, why Jackson had to fight all of these things if he was president. Like, could he just decide? Well, he decided, if I don't fight him now, they'll get too much power. And he's the only one who can do it. Does that answer it or not? Yeah. Yeah. And part of it, they all came up at once. You know, the nullification came up while he was present. In your removal, to his point of view, we are ready to take that land or just destroy them. And in the bank war, their charter came up in 1836. Okay. And part, and also, you know, Jackson is one of those people he needs to fight. He's got to fight somebody, and you'll fight. And so, once again, like we had. Uh, the picture of Jackson. Who's the other picture I showed during the nullification? Do you remember? John. John. C. <laughs> Calhoun. And what else about Calhoun? <laughs> so there's Biddle. Yes, he looks 14 years old. And but Biddle's head of the bank. It's more complex than that. But we have Jackson and Biddle. And here's the thing: the bank's charter, which will run out in four years, was that they 
print the money. So we have currency, and I'll, put, I'll show you if there's a piece of currency in the next one. Just paper money. It wasn't green yet. You look at green currency, that will come in the Civil War. So they print money, but the thing about it is that, that gives them great power over the money supply. But it gives who great power? This thing that can affect every part of your life is controlled by people who were never elected by the people. Remember, Jacksonian democracy, it's majority rule, and yet the concentration of the power is in the hands of a few unelected people who make up this new entity called the corporation. It's the first real modern corporation in the United States. And who owns it? Stockholders. And stockholders, they only invest in a corporation because they want money. So this means unelected people with such control over the basic necessities of life. How much your dollar will buy, especially by things like your family needs and you need for survival. So that fits into this idea of that. We must fight this. If we don't, we'll get too much power. There's no other real corporations. There's still companies that have investors, but the corporation as a legal entity is literally just being created at this moment. Where? Belgium. Where else, right? Doesn't everything come from Belgium? Yeah. Uh, French fries with uh, mayonnaise? Belgium. Waffles. Belgiums. Belgies, is it? Uh, what else? What else do they have in Belgium? They do have chocolate there. Uh, swamp. Trees. So, with that, the election of 1832, Henry Clay is going to run for election again. Now, Henry Clay, remember, ran in 1824. And he thought everybody wanted the bank. So he pushed the bank recharter four years before he was up, thinking Jackson will be hurt by this. He wants it an issue in the election. He knows Jackson. In fact, he's daring Jackson to veto it. He's daring him to veto it, which Jackson would veto. So Clay, who was Speaker of the House, Got it through. Now, Clay just assumed everybody agreed with Clay, because most of the people we hung out with, people agreed with him, so we're all think alike. Here is a pretty gruesome cartoon. This is Clay shutting, it's, it's, shutting Jackson up because, uh, or sort of Jackson and democracy, because of the bank. And what he's doing is he's holding him down, sewing his mouth, his lips shut. Oh! Now, wait, wait, wait. Look at the needle. That's a needle. And by the way, don't do that. Is that for me? I can leave. See ya, So, by the way, isn't that gruesome? Do you like that one? I didn't see the screen until you asked. In fact, I didn't take roll. I totally forgot. So everybody, just relax for a second. Let's go to the next thing. The election, just so you know. Oh, I jumped the gun. Jackson would actually use the veto 12 times. He was the first president in American history to use it for political reasons. When Madison originally did the Declaration of Independence, Madison was thinking in terms of Sorry, I'm having a computer problem. Okay, Madison, was, Madison thought the president would veto unconstitutional laws. So it is still up in the air, and Barbara versus Madison was still up in the air. But Jackson would use it as a political tool. And that's the way it is still used today. And his enemies would say he's using it like a tyrant. So Congress voted for law, Jackson became. And so here is an anti-Jackson cartoon. I showed you this in the beginning of this unit. And it's in your textbook. Here's Jackson as a king, King Andrew the First, born to command and not listen. He's standing on the Constitution, the map of the U.S., the Declaration of Independence. And where does he get his power? King numbers, because he has the majority. So that is Jackson. Or is he standing up for the people 
from the elites and cons? Is he a man of the people? So this one, how do you get a small cartoon? I'm not because it's such a perfect cartoon, but I haven't found a bigger version, so I had to stretch it out. So it got a little pixelated. But let me explain it to you because it's fantastic. So here's like the people's house and the people cheering on, and all these rats are trying to get in. And there's like, this is Webster, and that's clay. Rats or mice trying to get in. Who's stopping him? Jackson as a big cat. Cat. Right? And here's something else. What do mice eat? What is the cat protecting for the people? Thank you. The complete circle has been made. Jackson as cat defending the cheese. Which, by the way, that's pretty funny that all worked out that way. So, cats represent democracy because they protect cheese. That's a really gruesome picture of clay being chewed up by the cat. So we have lots of gruesome ones here. In the election, it wasn't even close. Jackson won a resounding victory. And popular vote, remember, though, that doesn't matter a lot. You won by over 200,000 votes, but a national victory. And that, Jackson saw, the people voted for me to destroy the bank. A mandate. Destroy the bank. Now, maybe or maybe not, but that's what Jackson decided to do. And so, oh, this is kind of funny. Look how many people voted for the anti-Mason party. And they got the state of Vermont, which was terrified of Masons, obviously. Go there today. I've never been to Vermont. I just want to say something. Who's been to Vermont? Yeah? I'm going to go in the fall. I'm going to be wistful for a second. Okay, so, oh, you'll notice that South Carolina voted. South Carolina, this, this was happening at the same time as the nullification crisis. What a time. So South Carolina's just about ready to issue the ordinance of nullification. So as an anti-Jackson vote, they voted for a congressman by the name of Floyd, who was a, found, a follower of Calhoun. That's why you see that state. You know, that's why you have that state. Good old South Carolina. So Jackson did this. The government receives are supposed to go into the Bank of the United States. He pulled them out by executive order. It's unclear if he violated the law. Probably not, but he almost, they, uh, they talked impeachment over this. And what he did is they put the government revenue in state banks that soon got the name pet banks, like they're the pets of Jackson. So they took government revenues and so from money that the U.S. got from taxes and put them in state banks. Now, there are there were problems with the Bank of the United States the way it was set up. And Jackson knew that. His instincts were right on that, I, I would argue. But his solution, no thought at all. It was just, I don't know where to take this money. Let's put them in these banks. So they didn't have like a, what's called like a sub-treasury system or something. And so here's a poster of Jackson, and he's holding up the decree to take the money out. And you see, you recognize the building? Yeah, the columns of the bank. And do you see Biddle? So, you know, there's a lot of that hairy double like character, huh? Good old, yeah, that's rare you say that, but people should say that more. But here's the thing most banks didn't have rules. And some of these banks, they start making loans to other banks. These fly by night banks would operate, kind of just come up, we're a bank, put your money in. And soon these banks without rules became known as wildcat banks. Because Jackson kind of fueled this, because he wants to take money out of the banks, all of a sudden there's money just started appearing, these banks formed. And these were in various states, and they started making risky loans. Risky means they're loans to people who might not be able to pay it back. But people who are risky, banks can charge more interest. So they get more money. They're kind of rolling the die. And they were getting the money from depositors, but also borrowing it from other banks, which is what happens today. And so they started making these loans. You had Indian removal. Land was opening up in the West. Now, when I mean West, I mean like Illinois or Iowa or Mississippi, you know, that kind of thing. And there's a belief that land is going to go into great demand. 
What happens to prices if it goes into demand? Prices begin to go up. And all this money from wildcat banks would be the fuel for land speculation, which would create a bubble. So bubble being the prices kept getting bigger and bigger, like a bubble would, greater than the actual value. And you think, wait a minute, how could land or anything else get greater than the actual value? It's because everybody thinks they're getting rich. And if you sell your land for a great profit, you know, boy, my land price is double. I, I make 100% profit. What do you do with that money? You buy more land because we're all going to get rich. And other people see it, they start borrowing money to buy more land. And the prices get greater and greater and greater. And the thing, what why the bubble is a good analogy is once people realize, ooh, these are overvalued, the price just doesn't gradually go down. What happens? Overnight gone. Overnight gone. We'll come back to a little bit of this. So it starts feeling in um, real estate. Almost every bubble in over speculation, you get a real estate, a real estate bubble like that in your lifetime. We had a huge real estate bubble in 2004 through, to, through 2007. And when that popped, it brought down the entire world's economy and nearly destroyed the planet. We almost went into, uh, yeah, it was, it was bad. Don't you remember you were six? How about right? <laughs> you were paying attention to the credit, to the paper market? Okay, hang on. So Biddle was furious. Yeah, this is, this is a Bank of the U.S. note, and this is supposed to be the American public puking out gold coins. I, I don't know. I'm not sure what's happening there. But Bill, once he took the money out, Bill wanted to punish Jackson and show the importance of the bank. So they took money out of circulation. Okay, they quit issuing new paper currency to banks. So the amount of money in circulation called velocity began to go down. Now what happens if the amount of money in circulation goes down? What does that create? Deflation, and that was his idea. He wanted to create deflation, and he knew deflation would destroy the economy. So he could say, look how important the bank is now. Think you need the bank? Look at us. We can make or break the economy. And he's also hoping Jackson would get blamed. So people would say, Jackson was so wrong, and bring back Henry Clay as president, maybe. Yeah, that's Webster and Clay. I think that's supposed to be Biddle, but it's not clear, and they're puking out gold coins, and then he's also be puked a lot. And there's Jackson looking in there. Okay, political cartoons from 1836 are hard to follow. It's like he's putting money back in the speculation. Is it the bank that's puking? Oh, God. I'm... We don't have enough puking cartoons, but what this would create was a panic, an economic panic. And he did it on purpose, which, by the way, doesn't that prove Jackson, exactly what Jackson said? They will use their power and influence to control the economy for their own personal gain, whether it be power or money. So Jackson could say, I told you so. So Bill would begin to create this panic. Now, here's the thing. Remember I showed you about deflation or Chase's rebellion? And when the value of money goes up, who does that hurt? Debtors? Creditors. Remember, debtors are the one who borrow money. Creditors are the one who loan it. Who does it help? Who does it hurt? I mean, who does it hurt? It hurts debtors because they got to pay back money of higher value. So if they got to pay hundred dollars and there's deflation, that hundred dollars is a lot more valuable than it was a year ago. Well, you already have all these debts in this land speculation, and now you have deflation being created. And then, in response to the panic. Jackson issued the specie circular. Specie means gold and silver coin. All right, we got this bubble going on. We got to do something about it. So what they said is federal land only with specie. The thought was if they only use gold and silver coin, there's not as much gold and silver coin. The price of federal land will go down, and that means all land will go down. He thought that would drop prices and end the bubble. So Jackson was trying to create deflation too. Now, this was just almost a, not quite panicky, but 
you didn't know what to do. So, okay, we'll just say you can't or make it harder to borrow money. But here's the thing. If there's less gold and silver in circulation, that means that means the gold and silver coins can buy more. So the prices drop. All of a sudden, land prices that were growing, and then the economy is unstable with bills deflation, and then all of a sudden, you can no longer buy government land with, with soft money. And what happened to the bubble? Gone. Bubble, gone. Prices dropped 80, 90% overnight. Overnight. Now, just imagine. In fact, this is a cartoon you're supposed to show. This is a speculator going to Illinois you know, to get rich on the land. And look at this one. It says, I am going to Illinois. I have been there. And look at the horse starving. They're just, they starve to death. And it's basically saying, you're not going to make it out there. Now, let's say you thought you had land with $1,000. And then the bubble burst. And now the land is worth $200. What happened to that $800 of wealth you thought you had? In fact, the $800 that you might have used as collateral, collateral to take a loan out to buy more land or to buy farm equipment or anything else. Wealth you thought you had. I have this much money so I can borrow money because I have collateral. What happened to that, to that $800? Gone. Just gone. You thought you had money, now you don't. Gone. What is your future worth? How are you going to pay back your debts? What's going to happen to your property? Gone. Banks who think they're going to get their money back because you have you have land worth $1,000, now they don't get their money back. Gone. This is why, oh, I said bubble burst, prices tumble. This is where we get a panic. And this is why they call it a panic. When you think you have money that's worth something, and that's you know it's worthless. It's gone. Panic. And this can spread very quickly. So just imagine we have two banks in our town. Two banks. Bank A, Bank B, clever names, right? All of us in here, we put our money in Bank A. We put our deposits, we put a savings account in there. So basically what the bank is doing, they're borrowing money from you. They borrow your money and they pay you a little bit of interest. Because they don't keep that money. What do they do with that money you put in for a savings account? They loan it to other people or use it as collateral to borrow money to do loan to other people. So they don't keep it. They're assuming all of us won't come at the same time wanting our money. But let's say Bank B. None of us put our money in there, but we Bank B is right next door. And B, they've been loaning like mad to everybody, and now the prices tumble. Nobody can pay back their debts. And this is what a lot of banks would do. They put the shutter down at night, they go into the safe, grab whatever money's left, put it in their pockets, and go. Really? Yeah. That's not sending. And it's it's arguable that's illegal or not, because it's a business. It's business. What happened to all the people's savings in Bank B? Never existing. So think about what that does to people. Now, what do we do? We just saw Bank B go with a, what about Bank A? That's where we have our money. And what do we do? What's that? Say, uh, I'm sorry. Go get it, go get it. Yeah, they called it a run on the banks. And everyone goes to the bank to take their money out. They don't have the money. What happens to Bank A? Yeah. And so they go. So even healthy banks can go if there's a bank panic. And that's why they call it a panic. And that ripples everywhere. And you think banks that survive, they're going to loan any more money? What is everybody going to do if all of a sudden it went from, we're all getting rich to, I don't know if my money's safe. What, am I, what are they all going to do? Quit spending money. And that's how panics, which happen in your lifetime, lead to depression. So, what we have is the panic of 1837. And there was speculation. Now, you notice I focus on land, but there's also the new wonder technology of railroads. But we have deflation, bank failures, which I just talked about, and depression. Depression is long-term on a one. And this is right down for depression. This is the first time in American history there are a large number of people who are unemployed. 
that has never happened before. Yeah, there were people who didn't have jobs. But remember, jobs in the wage system is an element of capitalism. The things that you think is are the way life works was brand new. And here's the thing. If a company hires 100 or 1,000 workers, and all of a sudden they're in a depression and no one's buying everything, no one can borrow money because banks are either shut down, this company had 1,000 workers making whatever product. What product do we want? What product do people need? Widgets. So what are they going to do? No one's buying the product. Huh? And what do they do with their workers? Lay them off. They lay off their workers. Now, wait a second. Are those workers lazy, good for nothing? They should go find a job. No, what's wrong with them? There's no job. They could be the hardest working human beings, the most loyal people in the world to that job. They don't make money, they're fired. Or they could be the laziest person. It doesn't matter. They don't have a job. Someplace else and find a job? Hey, if you don't have no, if you don't have money, you can't say, you know, I'm going to go to you know, New York can find a job. It doesn't work. And so that was a system. This was anti-species circular, but it's a species clause. And here's a family indebted, can't pay their bills. And here's the debt collector coming, so the rent. And he's a worker. That's his toolkit. But no one's hiring. So it's actually a pretty good cartoon. And so here's another anti-Jackson one. Here's a run to the bank. Here's uh, all the, this is the sheriff's office and people need money. Here's the, it's also very anti-Semitic, but going to the panhandle to sell whatever you have because you have no money, you sell everything. And poor in the streets, living in the streets. There's the prosperity balloon going down. And then who's the son who said everything would be fine, but it's not. That represents Jackson. Here's another cartoon. <laughs> and here is... This is supposed to represent like um, money and prosperity. These are the chips of the economy. And here's the rooster trying to stop him, see, with US Bank, trying to scare off this jackass, Jackson, whose stupid policies are crushing the chips. So this is anti Jackson. Oh, I get it, Jack. Oh, it's dumb. We're coming to that. And here's Martin Van Buren. I love this one. So here's Van Buren as the wily old fox ready to get the U.S. bank. And he become the next president. That's supposed to be Martin or William Henry Harrison and the dog. So there's some issues here. By the way, this cartoon would be really popular. It would be more ones of, of Jackson and the Democrats as jackasses. And they would say, no, wait a second. These are hardworking animals that common people have. And the Democrats would turn it around starting with this cartoon and say, what animals do hardworking common people have? Donkeys. That's it. Right here. This cartoon. They turned it around. They kind of turned an insult into what they see hard working people. They were donkeys. That's what common people have. We'll get to how the Republicans would use elephant a little bit later on. So, with that, there's Jackson fighting the meaty headed beast of the bank. I like that one. But the panic would go on for six years and be the worst economic disaster to hit the world. But I have good news for you. The next one would be worse. And the next one, worse and worse. The booms got bigger, the busts got worse. And then one more thing. We're gonna go through all the cartoons. There's too many. I just put a bunch in there. One more thing. Calhoun did find one thing. Calhoun was always looking for a way to unify the South. And he found it with what's called the gag rule. And he, he's, his allies in the House and the Senate put a rule in that said no debate or even petitions allowed about slavery. This is what we call a litmus test. And the idea is regardless if you're a Democrat or a Whig, if you're a Southerner, you got to vote for this. It was a way to unify the South. And for over a decade, they would not allow the word slavery even to be brought up on the floor of the United States House or the United States Senate. They even, in the South, censored the mail from what group is opposed to slavery? Abolitionists. They censored the mail in the South. Because abolitionist mail, the belief was, would trigger what? 
if people heard that slavery was wrong. Exactly. And so I put this in here not only because it shows you an idea about Calhoun still trying to unify the South, but also slavery. By definition, to protect slavery, they will deny people free speech and freedom of expression because that, they always will argue, will lead to slave rebellion. And I'm going to jump ahead to one thing really quick. Richard Lawrence, in 1835, would be the first man to ever try to assassinate a president. He tried to assassinate Andrew Jackson. Now, no president had guards, or they just take walks, and he's taking a walk outside the White House. And Richard Lawrence, with two pistols, so these are flintlock pistols, so one fire. Well, he walked up. Jackson's just taking his walk with his cane, taking a walk. No guards, about five feet away. Lawrence pulled out a pistol, no warning, fire. Click. The hammer went down. Actually, the flint sparked, nothing happened. Everyone's like, ah! Pulled out the second pistol. What? Click. They went back and looked at the pistols after the fact. There was no reason they should not have fired. Absolutely no reason. They should have fired. And then everybody is still stunned. Who was the first person to act? Jackson. Jackson threw the man down and then proceeded to nearly beat him to death with his cane. <laughs> when they took the cane out of his hand, Jackson started pummeling him with his fists, beating him and beating him. They had to literally pull Jackson off to save Lawrence's life. Lawrence would be the first ever defendant in a federal case to be acquitted on the reason of insanity. He thought the beheaded king of England, uh, Charles I, had ordered him to kill Jackson and various things like that. And I don't know what's insane about that. <laughs> we should have this with the bell ring in 1836. Van Buren would be elected president and not front law quit. And also, so we'll get this tomorrow. So we got the law cabin campaign will not be there. I'm going to keep going while you take your test because I don't quit. There's no off switch on me. No, I'll have a test tomorrow and we get to the next thing. I'll talk about the essay on Thursday. There is still a slight chance I won't be here tomorrow, but I'm not a beater, so I'm going to get that test done. So, sound good? Yeah, you're taking it. And if, if the off chance I'm not here, you know, I have this up, put everything off and under your desk, and I'll tell them anybody looks suspicious, let me know. You know, but I know you'll be fine. And I will do collective punishment because I'm insane. Have a great day, everybody. Lauren, I don't to play about being in our slide here. Yeah. Yeah. Be my presence. See, it works. You like it? You know the end. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good story. Oh, great. Now, you people. Oh, I'll give you guys some. Manchurian candidate. Uh, here we go. All right, I can't hear cheesy. How is your day going, guys? Huh? Can I hear cheesy? Cheese. What is a democracy? Cheese and cats. That is another red toy meeting right Cats are the only thing that can fight red toys. Ah! So are we starting a movie on all Have you ever seen a bird? Oh, I yeah, think about it. Oh, that makes so much sense now. I've never missed an election. Do you vote, Mr. Parker? Oh, you're ready? <laughs> oh, so close. Let me get a Come on, don't run away. Yeah. Well, Tucker, did I give you one of these? <laughs> Airport, you can say it's a
movies in American history. It is a fantastic movie. It involves black and white and sweat. And, <laughs> and sweat. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's pretty funny how they try to show the tension. So, a couple things in. We're going to watch today's part. If you look at this worksheet, it has a couple different things on it. First off, it goes through all the Cold War fears, the fears of communism. And it shows me. So give me five examples of what it is. Briefly explain it and go from there. And the fear of this communist conspiracy, willing to take or trying to take over. And the communists could be everywhere. And I'll get to somebody in just a second. And then the rest of the questions go pretty much in order. And so the, the first part, that would be for the whole movie. Of course, you're going to see a bunch of them, especially in the second day. We're going to see a lot of them. And then the questions go all the way through to the last question. You got to think about them a little bit. I know it's horrible. And then on Friday, I'm not going to be here, but I tried to time the movie right because I really have to be here for that last day. There are things I must explain. What's that? No. Who thinks it's cold in here? Nobody. So with that, you're still whining about this. So it wasn't cold for his period. All right. Cold. I don't care. I have to take off Hey, I got the good story. So quit whining. I don't do it. I don't mess with that. All right, so, so let me tell you one thing really quick. So you're going to watch this. It'll be five throughout, and then pretty much follows it. And it's going to start out in the Korean War. So 52 after, remember, China entered the war. Don't forget the Truman Doctrine, assuming that every single communist is being directed from where? What building? The Kremlin. And who was the Republican junior senator from Wisconsin who, after the Chinese Communist Revolution and Joe Wan, which was the code name for the atomic bomb, accused the State Department of having 205 communists? And then it will go down to 51, and then eventually three, and then none. 
But here's the thing. He understood that all you have to do to discredit people is just put a number out. Put an accusation out. Because what does the media do? They do it now, and they do it then. What do they do? They tell the story, right? They said, this accusation. If there's a retraction, where is the retraction going to be? Huh? Yeah, like the back of the paper or maybe a little added addition at the very end of the news or something like that. But hey, most people just see the headlines. A big lie was much better than a small lie. And so this is going to show a McCarthy-like character. It's going to have the fear of the communists. It's going to have this international like, communist conspiracy of different communists from all over the world. It's going to show the Korean War. It's going to have Chinese. Remember, the Chinese are directly connected to the Russians, right? All together in this conspiracy. And it's a classic movie, but also fits in brainwashing. And what does a communist look like? Everyone else. You. If you were a communist spy, how would you act in the United States? I mean, think about it for a second. Dylan, what's your question? You're, you're right. Or, or they don't even hear that someone said. They just hear that it happened. A communist spy. Christopher Hutchinson is a communist in this room. So what? Oh my goodness! Busted! Have you read it? I'm reading it now. The um the actual economics part 